graduated with honours and moved to England where we worked for a while and then um, came over and settled in Christchurch with his family. So that's great. He's also a lecturer and lectures um, at the Kansas uh, District Health Board as well as um, the students at the university. So um, he usually wins the best lecture award for various reasons, but usually because he peppers his talk with a bit of drama, maybe song, poetry, a dance, I don't know. So I'm not too sure what we're in for today, but um, let's welcome uh, Sean McPherson. Thank you. Thank you. It's a uh, cool. Um, yeah, I'm Sean McPherson. I'm one of the consultant uh, hematologists in Christchurch. And I should say thank you to um, TV and Blood Cancer for inviting me to, to speak about uh, progressive lymphoma. Uh, I asked for why me, but I, I treat a lot of lymphoma um, and, uh, and I like to talk, so that kind of works. Um, I'm also the Chair of the Christchurch Lymphoma Multidisciplinary Meeting. We meet uh, fortnightly and discuss uh, cases. Well, yeah, we discuss cases, but we mustn't forget there are patients attached to those cases. We discuss those cases and, and decide collectively uh, what the, the best management is likely to be. Uh, so that, that sounds quite interesting. That sounds like a board of confidence, doesn't it? But what actually happened was that um, I, I failed to attend the annual general meeting two years ago and um, I, I was, when I came back, I discovered I'd been unanimous, unanimously volunteered uh, to chair the meeting. So it's uh, doesn't seem to be a particularly popular thing to have to do, but it's quite, it's quite useful. To it. uh, and the other reason, as uh, Helen alluded to, is uh, possible that you, maybe you might be expecting to need a bit of entertainment. Um, I was a bit late putting my slides together, and as of Wednesday, uh, I, I haven't really worked out what the entertainment might be. Uh, I've brought my ukulele and used it already, so at least that justifies having brought it. Um, you never know. So this is how the, the talk's going to go. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about what lymphoma is, but that's a, that's a tiny bit insulting because I think I imagine that you're all pretty much experts either directly or indirectly, so I won't dwell on that very much. But it's, it's difficult to pitch these talks, as uh, Professor Morrison said at the start. Some of you will be wanting heaps and heaps of detailed information. Some of you might just want a bit of a recap, so just bear with me. I might be telling you stuff you already know. I will be, sure. Uh, which lymphoma is to be considered aggressive or high grade? We'll talk about that. And we'll go through some of the different subtypes. There's no way I can go through all of them. There are, there's over, I think the last, there's certainly over 40, there's probably over 50 subtypes uh, of, of lymphoma. It's recently, um, everything was reclassified in 2016. And I, I swear that the histopathologist that comes to our fortnightly meeting makes up new ones every time. Um, never heard of that one. Is, is, that, is that bad or is it is, it's good? Is it? well, that's good. Oh, well, that's good. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, so just some of the different subtypes, not all of them. How they sometimes present, what sort of investigations we do to establish a diagnosis and stage of the disease. What sort of treatment you might currently expect in New Zealand, and a little bit about what sort of things might be uh, in store in the future. But remember, the diseases are quite interesting, but as far as I'm concerned, the patients are, this, you guys are what makes it all worthwhile. That's why I do this job. You're much, much more interested in your diseases. But I'm going to talk about your diseases anyway. This fella here uh, is a now, was an old patient of mine. This is this is a very, very remarkable man. Uh, the last I saw him was in 2002 when I left Scotland. Um, this guy is Martin Bennett. He's an internationally renowned and amazing musician. He's a piper and a fiddler. And uh, he actually had um, Hodgkin's disease, which I'm not going to talk about. Sorry, if you were expecting to say that, I can't talk about everything. That's what he had. Uh, he was fine the last time I saw him, but unfortunately, um, He's no longer with us, he died in 2005, but he was incredible. We had great conversations about music, and he, he learned to learn Spanish while he was, while he was in, in the war, and he brought his bagpipes, his electronic bagpipes, and he was just fantastic. We've been 
please read the biography to one of the stage plays about him, and he's just, he's just amazing. So I'll go and mention him again, but I'm not going to talk about much of it. So uh, again, one to lymphoma basics. Uh, so lymphoma is a cancer arising from lymph nodes or other lymphoid tissues. So you can look at the neck and the arms and the groin, and there's a whole heap of them that you can't feel that are within the chest and the abdomen. Um, other lymphoid tissue include the spleen and the tonsils and the adenoids. So cancer can arise from these organs, which cells uh, go wrong and become cancer as well as the lymphocytes. And Professor Morrison already talked about lymphocytes, which is really helpful. They're a subset of white blood cells that are really important as part of your immune system. And what they're supposed to do, you've got some uh, B cells eventually go on to uh, produce antibodies against the infectious organisms. So, uh, and, and about 80% of non Hodgkin lymphomas are B cell lymphomas. And then we've got T cells, uh, which target viral infections, and they also police uh, the body for the they spot the cancer cells and they take them out. That's what they're supposed to do. So they're really important for that. So about 20% of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma will be uh, T-cell lymphoma. So the specific type of lymphoma depends on which lymphocyte went wrong, which stage it was uh, in its development. So we're going to, today, we're, we're talking about, well, today, this hour or so, we're going to be talking about high-grade uh, lymphoma or aggressive lymphoma and some points of difference between high-grade and low-grade lymphomas. So high-grade lymphomas grow very rapidly, uh, whereas low-grade ones are a lot slower. And because they grow rapidly, they require very prompt treatment. You've got to get in there quick and do something about it, or you can get in trouble. Low-grade lymphomas, sometimes we just leave them alone, and, and we monitor, and we don't get in there to put those treatment, because the treatment is toxic. It's, it's basically, with chemotherapy, we, we poison you, and expect you to get better, and your disease not to. That's, that's it in a nutshell. So it's not very really clever, but it works. Now, most uh, so traditional chemotherapy works by targeting any cells that are rapidly growing and proliferating. So the, the good thing about the high-grade lymphomas is that they're very vulnerable to attack by conventional chemotherapy. And they're chemo-responsive, and this means that we, we can realistically talk about curing uh, many of them. Low-grade ones, we're less likely to cure, but we've usually got good treatment for them. We can get them under control. A few years down the track, we'll probably have to do something similar again. The good thing about that is there's time to develop new treatments, so there's always something on the horizon that might be of use to you. So I've got some examples here, and examples of the high-grade things that I'm going to talk about. A few large B-cell lymphoma, I used to think of it as a very homogenous, one-size-fits-all disease, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that, we'll talk about that. Burkitt lymphoma, the archetypal high-grade lymphoma. Uh, and mantle cell, again, it can sometimes be a bit lower grade, but there are certainly high grade versions of it. And then there's the T cell lymphomas, which are rarer, and um, yeah, we'll say a little bit about those as well. Well, let's start the story. So, shall I try and make it dramatic? <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, so, 66 year old man, and I met this guy in 2013, and I moved to New Zealand. Uh, he presented with back pain. He didn't come to me, he went to somebody else. He also he'd had night sweats, lost a whole lot of weight, his appetite was rotten, and you'll probably recognize these, these are constitutional symptoms or known as the known as symptoms. <coughs> so it's easy in retrospect, we know what he's going to have, but he didn't at the time. He ended up having a CT scan because of his back pain, and it showed that there was this great big lump of stuff that shouldn't have been there, right in the back, right adjacent to his, his spine. And that was probably the cause of the back pain. And the radiologist that looked at the scan said, well, that looks a bit like lymphoma. I think we probably ought to get a biopsy of that and uh, refer to a hematologist or an oncologist. Uh, this, is, this is a CT scan. And it's a, it, this is an upside down CT scan. If you've ever looked at your CT scans, usually the spine is down the bottom because the patient's lying on their back and feet at the bottom there. Um, this patient is lying on his front. And the reason he's lying on his front is because the interventional radiologist decided that they were going to, this was a good way of getting a needle into the mass. So the needle went in through the back there and into this great big grey lump that shouldn't be there. Uh, there's a kidney, there's a kidney, there's this, there's a, a vertebra, and there's the path of the needle to. So there's 
a great big lump of stuff that shouldn't be there. And some uh, there's some extra extra bits in here. These um, this is stuff that the this is sort of pipes and tubes that the uh, the surgeons put in because because of the position of that lump, it blocked the flow of the bile and the patient became jaundiced. So uh, the surgeons fixed that by sticking tubes in. And when I saw the patient have a, have a bag hanging up the side of the bile, which we could perhaps have avoided if we'd been able to make the diagnosis quicker, but this is really fast. Um, this is what the biopsy looked like. Um, how's this work? Uh, you don't need to be histopathologist, so that's not the point. This isn't working. Never mind. Okay. This is what it looked like. This is hybrid lymphoma. Very monomorphic bunch of cells that shouldn't, shouldn't look like that. And it was also present in this bone marrow. Again, you've, you've seen pictures of bone marrow and they all look just pink and purple, to be honest. But uh, most of these cells are normal, but this cell here is not. And this cell here is the same kind of cell. This is one of these lymphoma cells. So this is um, stage four disease. Now this patient required steroids initially and that shrunk things down and we managed to get the tubes out the mass disappeared and you need some chemotherapy and you got six lots of r -chop chemotherapy we treat people with anagrams here and it's a and r -chop is a combination of drugs one of the rituximab which is a monoclonal antibody that sticks to a uh, protein on the surface of the b cells uh, cd20 we've heard about that uh, and then c for cyclophosphamide h <laughs> for doxorubicin uh, o for vincristine and P for prednisone. So we've got anagrams that don't make any sense, but don't worry about it. Um, R chop times six, worth the treat, still going strong. Well, this worked very well. Now, he's a very keen mountain biker. This is not him. Uh, it's, a, it's a guy called Danny McCaskill. Um, and he famously rode along the ridge of the cool mountains of Sky where he grew up. And the reason I've mentioned this is because my old friend Martin Bennett. Uh, wrote, the, wrote the music that accompanies this seven minute video clip, short film. Uh, there probably won't be time to watch it at the end, but you should look it up if you've got a head for height and you're interested in Scottish music. Anyway, so we've got to say something about diffuse sparse cell lymphoma. Now, as the chair of the you know, lymphoma board, it used to be really easy. You know, these things, if it's diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I say, well, maybe the answer is our job. What was the question? So if it's localized, we can get three lots of our chop and a bit of radiotherapy, and that will often cure the disease. If it's more widespread disease, we'll usually need to give uh, six lots of our chop. Sometimes we go to eight, so usually it's six is enough. And this is old data. This is a survival curve. But again, we probably just explain about survival curves because there will be more. So um, you take 100 patients. And you, and you give them treatment. They've, got, they've all got the same diagnosis, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And you give them treatment and then you look sort of a few years down the track and see how many of them are still alive. So say five years down the track, the old treatment, CHOP, without the rituximab, in well, like the term elderly, that just means over 65, and that's not elderly as far as I'm concerned. But that's what, so in those patients, five years down the track, about 50% 50, 50 are still alive. We added rituximab, this is really old, this is 2005 reporting. Uh, we added rituximab to that, and suddenly 15% more were alive five years down the track. So, this is rituximab's good stuff. Don't memorize that because things are even better now. Uh, if you size B cell lymphoma, it's about 30% of all non Hodgkin lymphomas, and it used to be a one size fits all. We give our shop, that's what we gave, and we cure 60 to 70% of patients. But they kind of noticed that not everybody was being cured. Some people weren't doing so well. They thought, well, these diseases are not all the same. What's different about some of them? Can we predict the bad players and upper game? If we know which ones aren't going to behave themselves, can we upper game? And that takes us to double hip lymphoma, which I was definitely asked to talk about. Because, uh, you know, we know about this now. We know about it because of this guy. Martin Crowe, he was definitely not a bad player, but his disease was. Uh, and so this is a, a relatively new subtype. It's only been uh, around officially since 2016, when 
you had that reclassification of all lymphomas. Interestingly enough, um, it was first described in 1988, but this was sort of buried in our prestigious journal, and it takes a bit of time for us to catch on. Um, so we, we did know about these lymphomas that weren't behaving themselves as well as they should, but it, it took a bit of time to recognize it. And you guys were already aware because of so what is double hip lymphoma? <coughs> it counts for about 10% of diffuse large B cell lymphomas. It depends on which reports you read, but 10% is a fair, a fair approximation. In all of your cells, you've got genes that control cell growth and proliferation. And some, some of these, like MEC, that's a gene that promotes cell growth and proliferation. So you've got just the right amount of that stuff expressed in most of your cells, your healthy cells, and it doesn't go haywire. So that's an important point to have. You've also got genes that tell the, tell the cells to stop growing, and there's the things uh, called programmed cell death or apoptosis, and that's an important physiological thing for your cells to do. Uh, so they, they don't just carry on forever and become cancer cells. This protein here, BCL2, inhibits that process. So in your healthy cells, you've, just, you've got just the right amount of those proteins being expressed, and everything's fine. But again, Professor Morrison talked about this. We can look, sometimes the chromosomes go a bit wrong, and they swap bits of genetic material, they get a bit scrambled. And what can happen is if you can end up with this gene, which is usually expressed at a fairly low level, it ends up sitting next to uh, a gene that is expressed at a high level, like in B cells, like the, the gene that makes antibodies. So if you end up with MYC sitting right next to that, you end up with too much MYC being produced. Same goes for BCL2, the same thing can happen. So if the chromosomes get a bit scrambled, you can end up with overexpression of these proteins, MYC, and BCL2. There's another one, uh, BCL6, which is a little bit like BCL2. I haven't put it on the slide because I'm just trying to keep things simple, but it's also implicated. The important ones really though in double hip lymphoma are MYC and BCL2. So you end up with too much of those. So this is my analogy. If the cancer is a car, this is a very simple analogy. Too much MIC, and that's essentially you've got your foot on the accelerator saying, make more cells, make more cells, make more B cells. And then if you've got too much BCL2, it's busy, you know, what it usually does is it prevents prevents uh, cell death. So if you've got too much of that, it's like someone cut the brake cable and there's just nothing stopping the cells from making more of themselves. <laughs> But you know, you can understand how double hip lymphoma works. If you look at the cells under the microscope, they just they look pretty much the same as if you slash B cell lymphoma. Sometimes they look a little bit more high grade. In fact, the cells that I showed you, they looked a bit like Burkitt lymphoma, which you might recognize when we get to that bit. Um, Sometimes double hip lymphoma can have transformed from low grade lymphoma, uh, follicular lymphoma, because follicular lymphoma also often has that BCL2 overexpression. So if you get an extra hit, something else going wrong, you can end up with a, a, a more aggressive version of the lymphoma. Double hip lymphoma often presents with higher risk features like uh, high white cell count. Sometimes the nervous system can be involved. Uh, and stage can be a bit more advanced. LDH stands for lactate dehydrogenase. It's an enzyme. It's a bit more specific, but um, we sometimes use it, use it as a tumor marker because it can be raised in aggressive lymphomas. It's quite nice to watch it coming down in the blood tests as we treat the disease. We say, well, it's really working. Um, it's, much, it's much easier than doing a series of CT scans, but we do that as well to see how things are going. Less likely to respond to standard chemotherapy, double hip lymphoma, which is why we need to do something more than just our chop, because it's just our chop, the median, now that's not even average, but we just take it's, it's roughly the average progression-free survival 
that's how long you last before something else happens and the disease gets worse. Only eight months with a bullet lymphoma. So we've got to come up with something better than a heart shot, but upper game. It has to suit the patient. Okay. But um, well, we can talk about that in uh, question, question and answer. But it's got you've got we've got to treat the patient, not the disease. You're not just the disease. But we can ramp up the chemotherapy. Uh, this is a slide that I borrowed uh, from the internet. Uh, Professor Leonard, I better say that because I think we're live streaming. So somebody else's slide, Professor Leonard, a guy from New York, this is his slide. He obviously borrowed it from some other people because uh, we've got, this is one of these survival curves. This is double hip lymphoma. And you can see that looks worse, this line at the bottom. That's the uh, survival with our chop alone in these patients. They look back at patients that were previously treated that turned out to have had double hip lymphoma. They didn't do so well with our chop, but you gave them, well, you could ramp up the anagrams quite considerably and you would get better progression free survival. Unfortunately, progression free survival is it's a bit of a surrogate. It doesn't really mean that overall survival is any better. So these patients, they weren't really doing any better because we were giving them toxic treatment and that wasn't, no, that's not good for you. Uh, this is a bit, uh, I'll show you the next slide. This is a, a different uh, slide that I also borrowed from somebody else. Uh, this is from the MD Anderson Center in Texas. And uh, they looked at their, some of their cases that they previously treated. And this treatment, uh, our epoch, comes out a lot better than any of the others. And that's just with event free survival. Again, it's not overall survival, it's not the same thing. But actually, this graph is overall survival. So there's a clear survival advantage to ramping up the chemotherapy to that particular uh, regimen, uh, those adjusted our epoch. What is that? Well, it's an, it's an anagram, isn't it? It's an anagram for our chop with an extra E. And the E stands for atopocide. And I told my wife this, my wife's a GP. And she said, why don't you just call it our chop? Well, actually, we've got something a bit like that, but that just means giving our chop the same way you always give it and adding atopocide. Those adjusted our epochs a little bit different. And it's given over a period of four days. The initial dose is about the same as you get with our job, but you adjust the dose, and you do that by checking your blood count. And if we haven't, if we haven't poisoned you enough, we can tell because your white cells don't go low enough. So we check to see if we poisoned you enough, and if we haven't done that, we increase the dose next time round. We can. We can pull back if we poison them too much, but generally speaking, what happens is we start with one dose and we escalate about six times. That's certainly what I've done in the past with uh, patients where, where, where we've been successful. So you can end up with this pretty decent chemotherapy. You aim to get deliver six cycles of this. Is there any role for autologous transplant? That's been a question that we, we used to ask before we knew that our EPOC was a good idea. And um, yet, yeah, maybe. Maybe it is a good idea because it's a way of giving a very high dose of chemotherapy and then rescuing you by giving your cells back. It seems that hitting the disease hard the first time around is really important because if this disease relapses, it's difficult to treat. So we throw everything at it and put it in the kitchen sink. Uh, we certainly have done. In patients that were referred to the transplant committee that hadn't had those adjusted RE fault, we said, actually, we better hit this hard and we will do an autologous transplant as well as the but if you've already had those just our epoch, the evidence suggests that you don't need to do the transplant as well. So best not poison people unnecessarily. Do you have any better ideas? Because basically I've just increased the chemotherapy, I've just poisoned you more. That's not very clever, is it? Um, so there are trials looking at uh, targeting the actual molecular problem. There's a drug called venetoclax, which I've uh, Occasionally managed to get my hands on to treat people with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We can get that, a bit of paperwork, but we can get it. Uh, that inhibits PCL2, so that's an obvious thing to add to the treatment. So there are trials looking at that uh, in combination with those just our report or even our shock. There's what's this, a vinituzumab, that's a different version of rituximab. It, it targets the same protein, but it's, and we, we, we use that in chronic lymphocytic leukemia as well. So these are drugs that we've got. They're just not funded for this particular um, indication. 
Anita clax can be uh, combined with other things that we can also get, like the tuxamab, bendamustine. Uh, that works in mice. <laughs> and we can we can also give things like ibrutinib, which is being used in chronic rheumatoid leukemia, and bortezomib, which we use in myeloma. We know that we can combine that with Benita clax. Again, it works very well in mice, but we start in combining these new drugs, we start to see different toxicities. We've got to be really careful with that sort of thing. So this is all within clinical trials. But there's stuff on the horizon that's quite exciting. What trials we have here, I'm not going to dwell on the trials because I will run out of time, and I've only got as far as the produced large B-cell lymphoma so far. Um, but this is a trial that we've got in, oh yeah, I'm sorry, there's a few here. Um, so, we can use other monoclonal antibodies. If you think about rituximab as a magic bullet which targets CD20 and, and kills cells that express CD20. And this is more of a poison dart because this particular monoclonal antibody targets a different protein, CD79A, so just a different protein on the surface of the lymphoma cells, but it's got poison attached. Uh, so you deliver the chemotherapy directly to the cell that you want to um, target. What else have we got? Uh, that's for um, the first one, that's for untreated patients. So that seemed like quite a good idea. Uh, and then we've got some other things for people that have relapsed. Again, I said it's difficult to treat relapsed patients with this condition, but if you're going to do it, we're going to have to have some new things. So we've got some new stuff. Uh, what's this? It's a different uh, monoclonal antibody. It's against a different protein on the surface of B cells. We've got this trial, they get benetuzumab, a different monoclonal antibody, and that's an upland. Ah, oh, took me ages to get my head around that one. That's a that's a drug that inhibits something that inhibits something that inhibits uh, cell death. So it's just uh, I might put too many negatives in there. When you combine them all, it's a good drug for killing cancer cells. But it's it's very complicated, and you can. Combine it with the metaclax, which makes sense. There's all these new things that we can do. This drug cell in XR is a drug that prevents um, the cancer cells from removing chemotherapy and steroids from the nucleus of the cancer cell. And it's, it's a good idea to have chemotherapy and, and steroids. Steroids, prednisone, very important part of uh, treatment for lymphoma. It's a good idea if it actually works. Um, the, Cancer cells can become resistant and, and remove these things from the, from the nucleus. So this drug here prevents that from happening. So we've got all sorts of things. And these are trials that are running in Christchurch and other centres in New Zealand. Right, that's not that. Definitely. We talk about Burkitt lymphoma. Um, it's it's the sort of archetypal hybrid lymphoma. Uh, you might be. This might sound familiar. This particular story. 17 year old head boy of a local school. Uh, he presented with a couple of weeks of just something, it wasn't very long. He wasn't feeling at all well. He had sweats, fevers, he lost a whole lot of weight. Terrible. And he had this strange fleshy lump that was growing down from his upper jaw and was displacing some of the teeth. And I remember, he, he, so he, nobody knew what was wrong with him. He was being looked at by one of the general medics and they were speaking to me about this. And I wasn't really listening properly. And I said, well, what, what do you think is going on there? So I don't know, biopsy the lump. That'll, that'll give you the answer, just biopsy it. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. Well, it's not going to be, it's not going to be anything like the lymphoma, though, is it? And I wasn't really paying attention. I said, nah, 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 it won't be that. Of course it was. The bucket lymphoma. And this is Jake Bailey. And um, probably seen his speech, maybe. Famously delivered a speech during treatment. Uh, it's quite something. And he's done incredibly well. He's busy on the, he's on the public speaking circuit in Australia. Um, so, yeah, he's another very, very memorable patient. Um, I have some bizarre memories of, 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 of when, when he uh, was admitted. Uh, I remember telling him and his uh, mum about the diagnosis and having a, a strange conversation about sperm storage prior to chemotherapy with him and his mum and this guy that I assume was his dad but wasn't, it was his headmaster. Um, <laughs> so that was a bit odd, so I'm pretty sure you mustn't make these assumptions. Why? Why? 
But to be fair, the, the school was incredibly supportive and helped them through, and they were a big part to support them. Um, I have another bizarre memory was uh, he became ill with an infection and uh, he was kind of out of it for a few days. Just, just, he slept through most of it, which was quite nice, really. Uh, but then he recovered, and I was speaking to him, and he said, Man, it's this weird, weird dream. Well, it's not well, I just, you were in it. Was I? Well, I said, what, what was it? Yeah. Well, you, you, were, you were in the room next door and you were, you were playing it, you were singing Flower of Scotland. <laughs> and <laughs> that's fucking you. Um, <laughs> actually, actually that, that didn't happen. <laughs> I had to do that, yeah, because uh, there were some TV guys and uh, we said, no, you should go in and uh, sing a song to a uh, patient there because he's very well. Go and sing a song, uh, anything. Flower of Scotland, that'd be, that'd be great. You should do it, they'll love it. So I did. Uh, and that's uh, a year. Um, anyway, he still pops in to say hello. We can have a rendition of Flair of Scotland later on. Um, Burkitt lymphoma. That's what it looks like. It looks a little bit like those cells I showed you from the other guy, you know, but he's got these horrible, horrible looking cells. I take it from you, these are horrible looking cells. Ian probably said these look really great and he gets excited when he sees that we love cells. And like, these are not nice cells and they're not good for your patients. Great. Um, it's not very common, but one to two percent of all adult lymphomas. It's got this dubious um, distinction of being the fastest growing human tumor. It's got a doubling time, so it doubles the number of cells in under 24 hours. So that's exponential. That's that's like science fiction. That is horrible. You don't want one of these things. You've got to get on top of it quickly. This gene, Mick, uh, that we have in double hip lymphoma. Is once again, implicated the same scrambling of the chromosomes that does this. It's uh, it's present in about 98, but we can find it in 98% of cases, and it's really there in 100%, but it's not all that sometimes. There are various different kinds of Burkitt lymphoma. There's the endemic kind, which is first described in Equatorial Africa in 1958 by your man, Dennis Burkitt. Um, that's not what Jake had. Jake had the sporadic form. Uh, you can also see uh, versions that are similar in association with HIV. You don't treat it, it will kill you pretty quickly. But because these cells are so rapidly growing and dividing, they are incredibly vulnerable to chemotherapy. And if you hit it hard with this anagram here, RI back, big common really, okay, um, then we can cure it in 70 to 80% of adults. And I'm got my fingers crossed that we won't be seeing Jake back again. Oh, and you get an interesting people came to as well because there's a high risk of this particular disease uh, affecting the central nervous system. He's a high profile patient, but actually there were two other 17 year old boys uh, admitted at the same time with Burkitt lymphoma. It's really, I said it's rare, but it's like London buses, you know, there's nothing for years now, and all, three of them come along at once. Um, so we had two of them in the uh, bone marrow transplant unit, the adult unit, and then one was treated in the pediatric unit, and that's just what suited the patient. So that was that too. Um, it also affects older patients. I've got a patient uh, that I saw about a fortnight ago, uh, also diagnosed about four, four or five years ago. He's done incredibly well, um, and he plays the trombone. And I play the trombone, so he comes and sees me, and we just talk about the trombone, and that's pretty much it. So patients are brilliant. Don't forget that you are one of them. Uh, mantle cell lymphoma. We'll say a little bit about that. It's not always high grade, but there are certainly high grade versions of it. It accounts for about five percent of all lymphomas. Um, men more than women, so two to one ratio there. And usually presents uh, patients in their sixties. Um, these are what the mantle cells look like. Again, Ian showed you what mantle cells look like in the bloodstream. That's not always a bad thing. There's quite a low grade version of mantle cell which presents with this leukemic version of things. Why is it called mantle cell? That seems like an obvious question. Mm -hmm. um, the lymphoma cells basically look like cells which would normally be present in the mantle zone uh, of the lymph node. And I've got a picture of that. This is, this is the cartoon version, which is easier to understand. So you've got these things called you know, germinal centers where all the action happens. And, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, 
the, the, the B cells uh, come into contact with the infectious agents and they, they, they uh, get activated and they, they know later on that they start making antibodies. And so there's a lot of activity goes on in these germline centers. And that's what they look like in a normal lymph node. You can stain uh, you can stain these mantle cells. This is a, a lovely version of mantle cell and homework where the mantle cells actually stay where they're supposed to be. So these are these are mantle cells in the mantle zone of a lymph node. This is fish looking for cyclin D1, which is the gene implicated in mantle cell lymphoma. And I'm not going to talk about the fish because Ian Morrison already did, but you can use this fancy test to make a diagnosis of mantle cell. So target lymphoma's got neck, double head lymphoma's got BCL2, and then mantle cell has got cyclin D1. And it's all to do with your scrambled chromosomes once again. Classical mantle lymphoma does behave aggressively. Quite often it presents with a widespread swollen lymph glands, blood and bone marrow are often involved, sometimes the spleen is big. Um, it's considered incurable, but we've got much better at treating it. Because it's considered incurable, you've got to be sensible about what you do to people. And you can you can work out the prognosis based on a number of things up front. They called the NIPI score, so that's like a mantle cell lymphoma international prognostic index. And we can tot up a few features and work out which risk group you fall into. So being really old is not good. Better to be slightly younger. Being having poor performance status, so being unfit is not good. It's better if you're young and fit. LDH we mentioned before, if that's high, that's one that's another risk factor. And if your white cell count is high, that's considered bad as well. And if you add all of those things together, you end up with three different groups. And you end up with this sort of survival curve, and it divides up depending on which group you're in. So there's a low risk group here, this pretty well actually. Where are we? 84, so that's seven years out. About 65% overall survival there, that's, that's pretty good. You might not want to be too nasty to those people. Uh, they might not need treatment immediately. And then you've got an intermediate and a low, uh, high risk group which don't do so well. So you might want to be a bit more aggressive with their treatment, depending on how fit they are. So say you've got someone who's low risk or they're a bit crumbly and you know not, not very fit and elderly. You can always treat them, you might just watch them wait. Sometimes you can just do nothing for years and they don't need treatment. When he does require treatment, bendamustine and rituximab seems to have a pretty good response rate. Clinical trials, I quite like to have something a bit clever for this disease as well particularly as we consider it in the What if you've got someone who's fit and you know, fit for hard going treatment? Uh, we've got this thing called the Nordic Protocol, which is, again, it's a, it's a complicated anagram. Uh, we've got this thing called the R-maxi chop, uh, alternating with high-dose cytarabine and rituximab. So six cycles of that, and then we hit you with high-dose chemotherapy and an autologous stem cell transplant. And six-year progression free survival of Two thirds, that's pretty good. Overall survival is about 7% at 60 years. So that would be awful. 70% much longer. So good results with that treatment. But it's toxic, it's hard going. Um, the people that are sort of in between, they're a little bit older, but they need some treatment and they're maybe fit enough to have something more intensive than just our bend the musty. Um, my colleagues in Dunedin, um, they, they came across this regimen, which is Bendamustine and Cytarabine now. This was reported in an Italian journal and these early days there, two, they, they, they were only looking to survive a lot two years, but good results. So that's one of the things that we can do. Should we be giving rituximab as maintenance after treatment? Probably shouldn't even mention it because we're not doing that, it's not funded. We can't we can't do it here, um, not easily, but it looks like the survival curves are better if you do get toximab after your treatment compared to none at all. This is the overall survival. So overall survival is actually better than toximab as well. We could, we could. We 
relapse disease, you might try something you've not used before. So like R band mustard or R bag if you haven't had been mustard before. What about a tablet? That would be good. You've written it, we use that in chronic polystipopenia. Again, difficult to get a hold of, but things will change, I'm sure. We know it's good for um, an antel cell. So, and there are other things that we can use for tesimate, which we use for myeloma. We know that it's quite effective in mantle cell. Lenalidomide, we use that a lot in myeloma. I can't use it for mantle cell. It's not fun, but there are things that, again, they're on the horizon. For a marrow transplant, or if you've got someone that's young and fit enough for that, maybe you should consider it because it's really probably the only way we can uh, realistically expect a cure. And, oh yeah, okay, that's another tablet that we I've managed to get somebody onto that for chronic osteopenia within a trial. We've got a trial here, a big calibrusinib. This is for people that haven't relapsed, this is for untreated mantle cells. So, but we've got these trials going, there's stuff on the horizon, it's all looking a lot more exciting than we do. So, different, similar drug. I could potentially use that. So, we've got trials that we could. And CAR T cells. I'm not going to say anything about CAR T cells, it's been said already. The man in the background knows more about them than I do. Um, but there are ongoing trials. The mantle cell is one of the areas where CAR T cells might uh, have a big part to play. I'm not going to say much about this because ours is already five minutes down and it's really hardly in the time. Uh, anyone remember this guy? Mm -hmm. Mr. T. Guess what kind of lymphoma he got? He got T cell lymphoma. Uh, it wasn't high grade, he's got mycosis fungoid, he's got low grade T cell lymphoma, he's okay, uh, he's doing all right. But I thought, you know, it's just not fair, is it? These are, I don't have much to say about these, these are much rarer than T cell lymphoma. <laughs> 10 to 15% of lymphoid malignancies, and if, uh, if you remember my math, my math is not good, is it? 20% uh, of the non hodgkin lymphomas will say 80% of the T cell. Very hard to diagnose, this is one of the big problems. It masquerades infection, and, it, and, it go, and these patients will go with you know, lumps that you know, they come and go, they, they get bigger and then they go away again. They have constitutional symptoms like fevers and things like that that we know is to do with lymphoma, but they also, that's what you see in infections. And you say, well, with lymphoma, you get a lump and it just gets bigger or it doesn't go away, but with T cell ones, sometimes they do go away and they end up, it takes a long time to diagnosis to be made because they go to EMT. And they say, oh no, it's gone, I'm not going to buy up to that. And then they have to come back and it's just very, very difficult. So you end up with delays. The other thing is the biopsies are difficult to interpret. Histopathologists often disagree with each other. So you end up with late diagnoses and, and some diseases that to treat. Here's an example angioneoblastic lymphoma. Uh, I've got some memorable patients with this. I've got a patient at the moment who, uh, I said, well, you could do some chop. Sure, I mean, we can give you a talk, so that would be quite good. He said, no, I don't want that. I've got too much other stuff going on. I hate to have Parkinson's disease. How will it affect that? So, well, it's probably okay. He's a neurologist. The neurologist said, no, no, treat a lymphoma. He said, no, I'm not doing it. not having that. He went off to Switzerland and he had goodness to me and stuff like that. It's a disease that sometimes goes away. And he comes back, he's done incredibly well. I'm grudgingly delighted. I see him every so often and his Parkinson's disease has got better as well. At the, moment, at the moment, he is requiring some steroids to keep things under control. He's doing great. What a good decision he made. Um, I've got a few patients that just don't listen to me. They do their own thing and they're, they're doing fine. It's great. Um, patient in Gloucester, uh, they diagnosed with TB because it's it, difficult to diagnose. Eventually, we got the right diagnosis. She responded to child chemotherapy. Uh, and again, this is a case in point. It's a sad story. Patient in the UK before I came in here. Uh, we did not make the diagnosis. We were suspicious. We got a biopsy. It was reported as reactive. This is an infection. I said, well, I'm not going to give chemotherapy for an infection. Diagnosis was not made until three years after the patient died uh, when a different pathologist looked at the, at the, at the um, material. So, very difficult to diagnose. This is incredibly rare. Pactus spinal gamma delta T cell lymphoma. And the only reason I mention it because I've got a patient with this now who's having a bone marrow transplant because you don't do something like that, it's, it's, it's a bad one to have. 
five year overall survival is 7%. It's really not. The only, only allocation I remember with this was in 2002 in Edinburgh, and he had ended up getting kept across right this rush in his knee joint, um, and he, he did not do well. This guy's doing fine just now, let's keep our fingers crossed for him. Another very memorable patient at this one. I've never heard of this one before, man. As I said, I, I swear our history pathologist makes things up. But um, this is not a good one for me to have. I have a patient with this. His best chance is with six lots of uh, choet, uh, given fortnightly, followed by a transplant. He never got as far as the transplant. But he was a wonderful, wonderful patient. He was a late diagnosis again. He was a, a psychiatric nurse. So I thought, he's going to be angry and it's going to be difficult. He wasn't. He was stoical. He was wonderful. And we only got, we only got gratitude from him. And I didn't think we didn't really deserve it. We didn't deserve it. He was brilliant. He invited me to his leaving do. And he asked me to play some song. And I did. And I thought, what a wonderful gift. At least he had the good grace to wait until we diagnosed relapse disease. Because I've got another patient who uh, arranged a uh, living wake. Uh, as soon as he was transferred to my care, which I don't think was a great vote of confidence, but never mind. And he's fine. Anyway, this guy, not, not so well. My, my job at this point was just to get him there with steroids and transfusion. And got there, it was an amazing party. I'll never forget it. It was a beautiful, it's, what a gift to everyone else. I'm going to finish with something a bit more cheerful. There is a T-cell lymphoma that's a bit more common and a better prognosis. Um, Anoplastic T-cell lymphoma, five-year overall survival of 70%, so it's a bit more like the, the, the T-cell lymphoma results. Particularly if it's positive for this gene. Um, constantly learning new strategies uh, we're learning more about prognosis and management of these diseases. This is another one from an antibody with, <coughs> with a, a poison attached to it, which is uh, being filed in this particular condition. It's, it's good for this stuff. And this ALK gene, we can target that as well. There's a, there's a disease, there's a drug, I can't remember what it's called, we don't have it here yet, uh, but it, it's FDA approved. To be honest, they're so rare, when we see these diseases, we have to hit the books on the internet, we get uh, we get help from international experts, we phone a friend, and we have these multidisciplinary meetings, we get loads and loads of heads together, and we nut it out and we try and come up with the best thing. Sorry, I'm really glad I didn't cover everything, uh, I've gone on too long. Uh, you've got a choice. Questions or motions or questions? You want a song? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sure. No, no questions. Just want to say, uh, you've got a choice of that flair of Scotland or a song that I sang at that person's birthday. Well, one of mine. It's nothing to do with lymphoma. I'm sorry, I don't have any lymphoma songs. You wouldn't appreciate them, it wouldn't be funny. Uh, but you enjoy flair of Scotland or one of mine. One of mine, okay. The storm blew in and the waves crashed down on the reef beyond the shore. And there were we looking out to sea as the rain began to pour. There was a perfect rainbow rising up, up from the sea. Cast a lullaby through a darkening sky like your arms around me. And I'm sitting here under the rainbow with you. Yeah, I'm sitting here under the rainbow with you. Pack up your troubles, your worries and woes, send them up on another flight. You won't be needing any of those, we got rainbows 
in the morning light. It's something close to perfect. Don't you like to do as you please? Sit back, relax, and grab some rainbow-tinted memories. I'm sitting here under the rainbow with you. But well, I'm sitting here under the rainbow with you. But well, I'm sitting here under the rainbow with you. Yeah, I'm sitting here under the rainbow with you. With you. <laughs> if you wanted the retractor maintenance, this maintenance, yeah. can you actually fund it yourself? I think you probably. No. If you uh, would like.